In this video we're going to have another look at the Riemann curvature tensor and a, another method for deriving it. So we have some manifold, the coordinate lines x1 and x2 are marked on it. We're going to parallel transport some vector v shortly around this closed path. First along pathway 1, a to b to c. And then we'll parallel transport it from A to D to C, and we'll compare the changes at the end there. Alright, so we'll compare the changes at the end. So, that's, now the paths will be along the coordinate lines X1 is A, X1 is A plus delta A, X2 is B, and X2 is B plus delta B, as you saw in the previous uh, diagram. Now, manifold. Uh, our closed path, I should say, on the manifold is a very small one. We're talking about an infinitesimally small path. So the condition for parallel transport is that the covariant derivative of the vector is zero. These are the components in here. This is the basis vector. Um, and so this tells us the components here, this expression here, is zero for the condition for parallel transport. If we apply this to the x1 direction of our manifold, then the condition of the component form is dv alpha dx1 plus v mu times gamma, the affine connection, alpha upper index, mu and 1 the lower indices, all that's zero. So that implies that dv alpha dx1 is equal to the negative of the uh, vector component times the affine connection. So path 1 begins here, we start, here's our vector and we're going to parallel transport it from A to B, the first part of the journey. Uh, the condition along this coordinate axis, the x1 coordinate axis, from x1 is a to x1 is a plus delta a, is dv alpha dx1 minus v mu times the affine connection. When we do, when we integrate that expression, we'll have v of b minus v of a is either this expression here, or is the integral from a to a plus delta a of the vector component times the affine connection. Next step is to integrate that expression from B to C, but the condition here is dV alpha dx2 minus V mu affine connection, but now this is along the x2 coordinate axis. So when we integrate, we get this expression here from B to B plus delta B is equal to this. All right. The net change in our vector for this path and going from A to B to C is V of C minus V of A is the individual paths summed together. There are changes due to the individual paths. And that gives us this expression here. Let's have a look at pathway 2 now, where we go from A to D to C. When we integrate from A to D, the first part, we get this expression here, dV alpha dx2 dx2 is equal to minus the integral b to b plus delta b, the components of the vector times the affine connection in the x2 direction. Alright, when we integrate from d to c, now moving along here, we'll have a to a plus delta a, this integral here, or minus this integral. This is now in the x1 coordinate direction. The net change for path 2, that's from A to D to C, will be V of C minus V of A is just the sum of the individual changes along the two paths that made up the total journey. We end up with this expression here. So the net change now when we compare the two paths will be the change due to path 2 minus the change due to path 1 and we end up with this expression along here. Now I'll just break that down a little bit further and this part is due to the journey from A to D. This was from B to C minus D to C plus A to B. The like integration variables, dx2, dx2 have been put together, dx1, dx1 have been put together. All right. And then this next portion here will be explained a little bit further on the next page. 
um, but what we'll do is use the Taylor series to expand the vector components or the change in the vector components, this bit here, at AD, use a Taylor series to represent it at the other side. Now I'll explain that over in the next page. So here's our pathway here. If we look at A to D, this bit along here, uh, this is a very small, infinitesimally small uh, path. So it's a very small one. What we're going to do is we're going to approximate the change in the vector as it's transported along this path A to D, expand this expression here as a Taylor series, uh, and so that we're going to be able to approximate, so that we'll be able to compare it with the changes along here. So we're going to expand it as a, uh, as um, in, in these terms here, and over here we're going to expand it about this path here. So we're going to approximate the changes in the vector components here by expanding it over here, because vectors can, in curved space can only be compared at the same point. You can't compare vectors at different points, because in curved space that's not possible. So vectors have to be compared at, at uh, the same point. So we're going to expand the changes in the components on this part of the journey in terms of th this part of the, of the path. So the Taylor series approximation for that to first order, uh, ignoring higher order terms, gives us this plus this bit here. Delta A is the distance along here, that length there. And so the changes in the vector components as they're transported from A to D, we're going to approximate with a Taylor series over here. When we do that, we'll be able to find that this bit here, dx2, will cancel with this bit here. And we're left with a negative integral of just this part here. And likewise on uh, a to b, we will expand as a Taylor series over here. All right. So we will compare the changes in the vector components. Uh, where are they? Change in the vector components here along here, expand it as a function over here. All right. And so what that will happen is we'll end up with this term here, which will cancel with this one, and we'll be left with just this term here, All right. plus the integral of this term here. So it's the Taylor series that helps us out here, where we approximate the changes, say, in the vector components along this path, we approximate them over here. And we can do that because it's a very small, infinitesimally small loop, so very close together, um, and we're just expanding it over here. Next bit. So a general change, uh, a general expression of the change in the vector is a transport around a closed loop. That's, that's the end result between the two different paths, is this object here. This is all that we're left with because the things on the previous page cancelled out. This bit here cancelled out with this bit, this bit here cancelled out with this bit, and we're just left with these first order derivatives over here. That's this expression here, and that's approximately equal to, for a very small loop, that's approximately equal to um, delta A length, delta B the width if you like, the area of the, of the little rectangle in there, uh, times this expression here. Now, of course, in flat space, this would all be zero, but in curved space, it's next. It's not. So, next step now is that we're going to expand these derivatives using the product rule, and we'll, that will lead us to the um, rule for the Riemann curvature tensor. Here we go. Delta V is this object here. We're going to expand this out. This bit here. dV mu dx times the affine connection. Expanding all these terms out, we'll get this. Uh, now, if we have a look here, um, this dV alpha dx2, uh, this dV alpha dx1, as we saw earlier, there's actual rules for those in terms of, because of the parallel transport condition, we can replace those, dV alpha dx2, with this bit here, the vector component times the affine connection. That's replaced there. Now we collect like terms. We need to do some index changes. Um, to make sure, whoops, my mistake, sorry, 
We need to do some index changes here um, to make sure that everything's okay. Um, when we do that, we end up with delta A delta V times, and we collect like terms, factorize out the V mu, and this expression in the square brackets is what we're interested in, as I just showed you a moment ago. So the bit in the square brackets is the curvature of the manifold, it's called the Riemann tensor. Um, for our particular manifold with the x1 and x2 directions, it's here. But what we also show is that the change in the vector as it comes along path 1 and along path 2, if we look at the difference between the end result for both paths, that's delta V alpha, it's proportional to the area of the loop. Just going back a little bit, that's proportional to the area of the loop there. Uh, as well as the curvature of the manifold. Now, as you can imagine, flat space, this is all zero, but not in curved. If we now replace the x1 and the x2 coordinate lines with x beta and x gamma, we get the general form of the Riemann curvature tensor for any manifold. And here we go. That's this one. This is, of course, assuming there's no, it's a torsion-free manifold. There would be an extra term if there was torsion involved, but we're assuming a torsion-free manifold and have done throughout this entire derivation. All right, well, that's that.